Welcome to Nailing It Down here at Barn Blog. We're going to continue our discussion of the effort program, this time focusing on Ingalls' critique of the draft program and some of its polemical usage. We're going to turn to a early um, polemic from 1971 uh, by the British and uh, by the British and Irish Communist Organization, which. Uh, I believe may have been the first time this prog- this uh, critique was printed in English, or at least in pamphlet form. It's hard to say though. Um, reception on some of this, some of these texts is a little bit more difficult than you think, but that's the claim. All right, I'm going to read from this introduction, which is a sectarian introduction, but it does go into some key information. Um, we will focus on the key information more than the sectarian uh, debates within it. All right. A prime example of the contempt for theory endemic in the British labor movement spoken of by Marx and Engels, for example, the preface to the peasant war in Germany, must surely be the critique of the effort, the effort program of 1891, or be more precise, that critiques near inaccessibility in English. The effort program of the German Social Democratic Party was adopted in October 1891 at the Erfurt Congress to replace the Goethe program of 1875. The errors in the effort program were criticized by Engels in his work on the critique of the Social Democrat draft program of 1891, note 21 in Lenin's State and Revolution, Peking edition, 1965. We can already see that, like Goethe, Lenin actually used Erfurt and Engels' critique of Erfurt for part of his argument in the State Revolution. Um, we are going to have to deal with State Revolution and its reception history itself. We've already read one whole chapter of it uh, in our discussion of the Goethe program. Um, we might have to read another chapter of it in our discussion of the Erfurt program. Um, and then by that point, we might as well do the whole thing. Um, State Revolution is an important early text in in uh, Bolshevism. It then falls out of usage during the 20s, 30s, 40s, comes back into play in the 50s, um, etc. Mike Manier goes into this uh, a good bit in his um, piece on controlling the bureaucrats. Um, although State Revolution, while it may not have been emphasized by the 1920s and 30s Bolsheviks, it is part of the Soviet constitution. Its frameworks actually do set up the frameworks <clears throat> for a lot of the Soviet constitution. So we can't say they weren't influential, but they weren't focused on in polemic, nor commonly taught. Now, it was revived by a mixture of new leftists and Trotskyists, although, again, uh, Trotsky himself did not focus so much on either the critique of the Goethe program or state revolution. I mean, it was important for him, but not, uh, it wasn't as crucial as it was for later proto new left Marxist. Anyway, anyone acquainted with Marxism must be aware of the attention paid to the German labor movement by Marx and Engels throughout their lifetimes due to the fact that the German social democratic was the best established, most powerful, most theoretical and nearest to Marxism of any of the world at the time. Due to a particularly acute contradictions prevailing in Germany as a result of the concurrent unification and industrialization within, quote, the colossal rhythmness of feudalism, which give our political pigsty in Germany its specific reactionary stamp, Marx and Engels regarded the lessons of the German labor movement of great value. However, subsequent British Marxists evidently do not agree with Marx and Engels. I don't know who they're talking about here, but probably Marxists in the Labour Party. But doing so with any particular British hypocrisy and or insularity is remarked on by the founders of scientific socialism. They do not openly come out with it. In the time-honored British fashion, they simply turn a blind eye to the to their own contradictory behavior. Whereas they pay minimum lip service to historical materialism, they give maximum serious attention I mean, they give minimum serious attention to it and indeed to the objective reality in general, quote, and we shall recall the importance of the offer program required for the whole of the in international social democracy, 
when it became the model of the Second International, we may state without exaggeration that Engels thereby criticized the opportunism of the whole Second International, Lenin, State and Revolution. I'm going to add here that a lot of what Lenin criticized, just like Lars Lee points out about what Marx criticized about the critique of the Goethe program and the critique of the effort program was removed. But it's still some things that I think linger, and those lingerings are problematic. I see Mike McNair's discussion in the last video on this topic. Consider the earlier program of the Socialist Workers' Party adopted in 1875 at the Gotha, at the Gotha Congress. Whereas the previous separate German social, uh, two separate German socialist parties, the Eisenachers and the Lasallians, united. This program was thoroughly opportunist since the Eisenachers made concessions to the Lasallians on all important questions and had accepted the Lasallians' formulations. That's a bit of an exaggeration. We'll come back to that in our Goethe program uh, discussion. Marx and Engels subjected the Goethe program to, uh, to withering criticism. Indeed, this work of Marx and Engels is best known in Marxist circles being contained in many editions of selected works, basic writings, pamphlets, etc. However, the fight, the fact that Marx and Engels regarded the effort program as critique of equal of equal moment as the Goethe program for the whole of European social democracy, so much that Lenin quotes extensively from it in his major work, State and Revolution, and despite the fact that the complete article of no greater length or difficulty than the Goethe program critique, as far as I can discover, it has only been translated into English and Marxism today in February of 1970. So the critique of the Eifert program was not widely available in English for a long time. Despite 50 years of the Communist Party of Great Britain to say nothing of its predecessor or indeed its successors. However, at least the CG, the CPGB, this is the old CPGB, until the 1950s made some real attempts at development of Marx and Leninist theory in Britain, the Revolutionary Anti-Revisionist Party, Communist Party of Great Britain, ML, makes none and is proud of it. So this is aimed at the, the, uh, the new Communist Party. From this morass of blind empiricism and an economism obscured by a screen of revolutionary phrase-mongering, must the British anti-revisionist movement be saved? This came about only by extensive analysis and synthesis of historical experience of the British working class and the proletariat internationally with a special regard to the political economy and ideology. So we can see this is a sectarian introduction, but it's important in that it points out how little this was translated. Nothing left will suffice, certainly not the undialectical pure politics, a parody of corrupt principle putting politics in command, espoused by the political manipulators with which the movement is so beset, as Ingalls pointedly expressed in the Peasant War Preface, const constantly to keep in mind that socialism, since it has become a science, demands that it be pursued as a science, i.e. that it is to be studied, emphasis added. Section 2. Especially worthy of note in Ingalls's critique are his explicit references to the movement of capitalism from competition to monopoly, from laissez-faire to imperialism, from the profound significance of this development for the working class movement, asterisk. We see this also picked up by Bukharin. In this way, Bukharin is actually picking up Ingalls' concerns. That's foreign talking on asterisk. So much for the opportunist excuse that Marxism has to be revised or adapted, as they prefer to call it now, for the present conditions of imperialism, which they say Marx and Ingalls did not foresee. This is aimed at Maoist, by the way. This part, this part of the critique is aimed explicitly at Maoist. Because Maoist, uh, while claiming to be anti-revisionist, also claimed that Marx and Engels were not as relevant for the current moment because they didn't foresee current conditions. This whole line rests on ignorance and distortion. Actually, the tendency of the concentration of capital to monopolies expressed throughout capital, all volumes, as historically inevitable. So much so that they make overclaims about it on authority, they being Engels, but still. So much so that the law of concentration of capital is a fundamental tenet of scientific socialism. And if that it is not clear enough, after all, if you British revisionists or anti-revisionists free capital or, or much of anything by Marx and Engels, Lenin says in the State and Revolution, here in the offer critique, we have the in, we have what we have is the most essential and theoretical appraisal of the last phase of capitalism, i.e., imperialism, viz. that capitalism becomes monopoly capitalism. This word gets redefined in the 50s, guys. 
the problem when approaching these texts now is a lot of these words have been re-theolized and redefined. A lot of must be emphasized because the erroneous bourgeois reformist assertion that monopoly capitalism is no longer capitalism, but can be termed state capitalism or something of that sort is most widespread. This is aimed at Hobson, for those of you who don't know. I did a, uh, a video long ago for uh, Zero Books that I think has been removed from the internet um, on the history of uh, pre-Marxist anti-imperialism and the theories around it. All right. Does not the CPGB line on this uh, CPGB ML mouse on state socialism via naturalization that immediately spring to mind in this context, creeping socialism via Westminster? No wonder the revisionists tried to write off Lenin's state and revolution by gibbering that it was written in exceptional circumstances of 1917 when Lenin was preoccupied with violence. The latter is quite true since the socialist revolution is about violence and it is it was class struggle and not class peace that Lenin was concerned with and complete contradistinction to the self-suppressed Leninists of the CPGB. Man, they're really mad. As for the exceptional circumstances they talk of, these were indeed brought about not by any historical fortuitous events as the obscurantists would have us believe, but because by breaking with the rottenness of the Second International to which the CPGB has returned, Lenin and his Bolshevik party were leading the masses in general revolutionary struggle. What could be more fundamental than the fact that the written history of all hitherto, hitherto existing societies is a history of class struggles. From the manifesto, for those of you who are wondering, quote, the communists disdain to conceal their, aim, their views and aims. They openly declare social, uh, they openly declare that their ends can only be attained through forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, manifesto again. Further, that force, however, for which her during is an absolute evil plays another role in history, a revolutionary role. That, that in the role, in the words of Marx, is the midwife of every old society which is pregnant with a new Engels anti during. And as Marx quotes so approvingly in the conclusion of the poverty of philosophy, Karl Marx's principal work directed against Proudhon, an ideologist of the petty bourgeoisie, note six of the International Publishers Edition. La combat ou la mort, la lutte sanguine ou la nid. I don't speak French, guys. C'est ni ce que la question est invincible passe. Combat or death? Blade struggle or extinction? This is a question exactly put. Thank you. Whew. A particular interest is what Engels here has to say about the wretched nations that the present legal status of the party in Germany is supposed to be enough to get through all of its demands by peaceful means. People are telling themselves and the party that the present society is growing into socialism while asking themselves whether it mustn't also necessarily grow out of the old social constitution and burst that old shell just as violently as a crab does when it molts. But gibber the revisionist, as an Ingalls go on to say, one can imagine that the old society grows peacefully into the new countries where people's representatives have all the power concentrated in their own hands, where according to the constitution, one can do what one will as soon as one has a majority of the people won over and democratic republicans like France and America and monarchies like England, where impending buy-off of the dynasty is talked of daily in the press and where that the, dyna the dynasty is powerless against the will of the people. And doesn't Ingalls say in 1886, preface to volume one of Capital, quote, at least in Europe, England is the, on is the only country where the inevitable social revolution might be affected entirely by peaceful and legal means. However, in their, usual, in their usual lying fashion, they omit to mention in the very next and final sentence, Ingalls goes on to say, he, Marx, never forgot to add that hardly expected the English ruling process to submit without a pro-slavery rebellion to this peaceful and legal revolution. Page uh, 14, Glashire, London, 1912. This will be noted was this will be noted was written over three decades before Lenin wrote State and Revolution, quote, in 1871, where England was still in the model of the of a purely capitalist country, but without a militarist clique and to a considerable degree without a bureaucracy. Marx excluded England, where revolution over one's people's revolution 
then seemed possible and indeed was possible without the preliminary conditions of destroying the readily made state machinery. Unquote. Today in 19... Today in 19... Ep, this is still a line quote. Today in 1917, the apex of the first generation of great imperialist world, these qualifications made by Marx is no longer valid. Both England and America, the biggest and last representatives in the whole world, the Anglo-Saxon liberty, in the sense that they have no militarist cliques and bureaucracy, have today completely sunk into into the all-European filthy, bloody morass of bureaucratic military institutions which subordinate everything to themselves and trample everything underfoot. Today in England and America, too, quote, the preliminary condition for, for real people's revolution is smashing the destruction of the ready-made state's machinery perfected in these countries between 1914 and 1917 up to the European general imperialist standard. Has this machinery since been dismantled or has it rather been extended and consolidated, particularly in, in the subsequent world war, not to mention the Korean? Has therefore Lenin's teaching has to be dismantled or contrary to its attempted refutation, the British Road to Socialism, the program of the CPGB, properly called the British Road to Crash Collaboration, is a typical of modern revisionism around the world at presently centered in the Soviet Union. Those petite bourgeois Democrats who sham socialists have replaced class struggle by the dreams of class harmony even pictured the socialist transformation in a dreamy fashion, not as the overthrow of the exploiting classes, but as a peaceful submission of the minority to the majority, which has become conscious of its aim. The pe pe petty bourgeois utopia, which is inseparable connected with the idea of the state being above the class, led to the practice of the betrayal and interest of the tolling classes, as was shown, for example, by the history of the French revolutions of 1848, 1871, and by the experience of the socialist participation in bourgeois cabinets in England, France, Italy, and other countries at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Marx fought all his life against petty bourgeois socialism. Unquote. Section 3. Nor can Engels' remarks about feudalism in Britain, much needed, su sucker to our pet petty bourgeois nationalists like the Workers' Party of Scotland. Ingalls is discussing what form of state organization is the most advantageous to the proletariat prior to the socialist revolution. Marx and Ingalls clearly spread out that the greatest advantages of bourgeois democracy served as the best springboard for the proletarian revolution, and this fe federalism Ingalls describes is just as, as such an advance, that of bourgeois democracy. It is an advance Marxists would support if there were broad popular demand for it, and to put the and to pull the teeth of national subversion and lay bare the basic contradiction in that of labor and capital. What Engels' suggestion is absolutely not in the basis for fostering a nationalist movement, no matter how heavily cloaked in pseudo-Marxist phrases amongst the working class of Britain. It was not such a basis when Engels wrote it in the period of flourishing capitalism, and still less when it was the case when Lenin wrote, quote, in the Western countries, the national movement is a thing of a distant past. In England, France, Germany, etc. The fatherland is a dead letter. It played its historical role, i.e. the national movement cannot yield anything anything progressive. Anything that will elevate the new masses to new, and economic, uh, to new economic and political life. History's next step is not a transition from feudalism or from patriarchal savagery to national progress, but a transition from the fatherland that it has outlived its day that is capitalistically overripe to socialism. The character of Marxist and imperialist economism, Moscow, 1969. Such Marxists as develop and apply Marxism by abrogating its basic principles are, in fact, renegades and perverters of Marxism. The communist movement will treat them accordingly. Uh, C.K. Maisel's Glasgow, July, 1971. We see interleninist polemic here. Um, and we can see a particular anger at both the Labor Party and at the um, CPGB and CPGPML. A little context uh, on the British and Irish Communist Organization, the BNICO. It was located in Belfast and in Dublin, and its leaders were Brendan Clifford. Um, it published things like the Weekly Worker in Belfast and the Irish Communist. It was uh, 
a, a malice group and a lot of what we just read was an inter malice polemic although one that um was in many ways at odds with other Maoist. Um, it was pretty strongly anti, uh, anti-Trotskyist. It also opposed Luxembourg and Graverism, which is interesting. We don't talk about the polemics against Graverism anymore. It opposed both Welsh nationalism and Scottish independence, although it strongly supported the state of Israel. Uh, for a lot longer than a lot of other groups. Um, it also supported the Khmer Rouge um, and opposed the Vietnamese. It was a Stalinist organization, but one can actually see the interesting thing about Marxist Leninist at this time period is it's sometimes hard to tell Marxist Leninist polemics from like ultra left Leninist polemics. So it's it's really hard to parse. They had a lot of unconventional um, uh, positions. They were pro-nuclear and nuclear weapons um, and were against the campaign for nuclear disarmament. They um, were strongly critical of both anti-Stalinist and anti-Zionist political positions. Um, so they're almost like anti dust marxist leninist They took a hard line against the provisional IRA, opposed the Irish hunger strike in 81. Um, they opposed the campaign to free the minimum, the, the Birmingham, the Birmingham six. Um, they even went so far as to defend the British monarchy at one time and opposed the UK minor strike. Uh, they took a nationalist turn in the 1980s, which is weird considering the polemic we just read. But, you know, they also were one of the, they were the second people to publish the the Critique of the Airfoot Proben in English. Very strange organization, all in all, in history. Um, so we're going to now go to Ingalls's critique so we can get an idea of what these guys are actually talking about. Now we've already read most of the airfoot program and also context for it. So let's go into the critique of the draft program of 1891. All right. The present draft differs very favorably from the former program at Goethe. The strong survivors of outmoded traditions, both the specific Lasallian and vulgar socialistic, have in the main been removed, and as regard to its theoretical aspects, the draft is, on the whole, based on present-day science and can be discussed on this basis. It is divided in three sections, the preamble, political demands, and demands for measures of protection of workers. The preamble on ten paragraphs. In general, it suffers from the attempt to combine two things that are uncomfortable, that are uncombinable, a program and a commentary on the program as well. This is interesting. The fear that a short, pointed exposition would not be intelligent, intelligible enough has caused explanations to be added, which makes it verbose and drawn out. To, that's kind of funny from the people who wrote the Communist Manifesto given the most famous parts of the manifesto are basically commentary on its program. To my view, the program should be short and precise as possible. No harm is done. Even if it contains occasional foreign words or a sentence whose full significance cannot be understood at first sight, verbal expositions at meetings and written com uh, commentaries in the press take care of all that. And the short precise phrase once understood takes root in the memory and becomes slogan, a thing that never happens with both explanations Two 
much should not be sacrificed for the sake of popularity and the mental ability and education level of our workers should not be underestimated. Cough, cough, cough. That's why I'm talking. Don't treat people, working people like they're stupid. Cough, cough. They have understood much more things than the shortest, most concise program can offer them. And if the period of the anti-socialist laws have made more, has made more, and if the period of the anti-socialist laws has made more difficult, and here and there even prevented the spreading of comprehensive knowledge among the masses joining the movement. Now our propagandist literature can again be kept and read without risking trouble. Lost time will soon be made up for under the old leadership. I shall try to make the entire section somewhat shorter, and if I succeeded, I shall enclose it or send it on later. Now I shall deal with the individual paragraphs numbered from 1 to 10. Paragraph 1, the separation, i.e. Pitt's... Mine spits quarries. Three words for the same thing. This should, two should be deleted. I will leave mines, begvek, which is a word used even in the, in the most level parts of the country, and I would designate them all by this widely used term. I would add, however, well raised and other means of communication. Paragraph two. Here I would insert, in the hands of their appropriators or their owners, the social means of labor are. And likewise, below, dependence on the owners are appropriators of the means of labor, etc. It has already been said in paragraph one, one that these gentlemen have appropriated things as exclusive possession. It would simply need to be repeated here if one absolutely insists on introducing the word monopolizes. Neither this nor any other words adds anything to this sense, and anything redundant in the program weakens it. The means of labor necessary for the existence of society. These are the, precisely those that are at hand. Before the steam engine, it was possible to do without it. Now we couldn't. Since all the means of labor are nowadays directly or indirectly, either by design or by their social division of labor, social means of labor, these words express what is available at every given moment sufficiently clearly, correctly, and without any misleading associations. If this conclusion is intended to correspond with the preamble of the rules of the international, I should prefer it to correspond completely. To social mi misery, this is number one, mental degradations and political dependence, general rules of the International Working Men's Associations. So Ingalls uh, is here like, hey, we already worked this out in the in the IWA, the first international uh, program. Uh, go, go back and get it closer. Physical degradation is part of social uh, misery and political dependence is a fact, while the denial of political rights is, de is a declaratory phrase, which is only relatively true, and for this re reason does not belong in the program. Paragraph 3. In my opinion, the first sentence should be changed. Under the dominion of individual owners. First of all, which follows as an economic fact, which should be explained in economic terms. The expression dominion of individual owners owners creates a false impression that has been caused by political domination of, of that gang of robbers. Secondly, these individual owners include not only capitalists and big land owners. What does the bourgeoisie fo following here signify? Is there a third class of individual owners? Are big, loaners, uh, are big land owners also bourgeoisie? And once we have turned to the subject of the big land owners, should we not ignore the colossal survivals of feudalism? which has given the, the whole filthy business of German politics a specific reactionary character, that actually isn't addressed. Peasants and the petty bourgeois, too, are individual owners. Uh, at least they still are today, but they do not appear anywhere in the program, and therefore the wording should make it clear that they are not included in the category of individual owners under discussion. When we talk about large owners here. The accumulation of the means of labor and the wealth that has been created by the exploited. The wealth consists of, one, the means of labor, two, the means of subsistence. It is therefore grammatically incorrect and illogical to mention one part of the wealth without the other and refer to the wealth total by the linking, linking the two by and. Increases in the hands of capitalists with growing speed. What has happened to the big landowners and the bourgeoisie mentioned above? <laughs> if it is enough to speak only of capitalists here, it should all be well, it should be so above as well. If one wishes to specify, however, that it is generally not enough to mention them alone. The number and misery of the proletariat in increases continuously. 
This is incorrect when put in such a categorical way. The organization of the workers and their constantly growing resistance will possibly check the increase of misery to a certain extent. This is Engels saying reformism does have an effect. They're not ultimate immiserationist people. However, what certainly does increase is the insecurity of existence, and I would insert this. Paragraph 4. The planlessness rooted in the nature of capitalist private production. This needs considerable improvement. I am familiar with capitalist production as a social form or an economic phase. Capitalist private production being a phenomenon which in one form or another is countered in that phase. What is capitalist private production? Production by separate entrepreneurs, which is increasingly becoming an exception? We don't have that many entrepreneurs anymore. Capitalist production by joint stock companies is no longer private production, but production on behalf of many associated people. That's something for modern socialists today to remember, too. And when shall we pass on from the joint stock companies to trust, which dominate, monopolize whole branches of industry? This puts an end not only to the private production, but also to planlessness. If the word private were deleted, the sentence could pass. Now, you hear a lot about the anarchy of the market, but what, what Ingalls is saying here is that um, the larger and larger scale of both trust and joint stock companies and their use of centralized planning to maintain profits means that they're planned. <laughs> um, Ingalls realizes this in 1891, and yet we still act like this is an issue today and that socialists didn't see this. It baffles my mind. Instead of this declamatory phrase, which looks as though excuse me, the ruin of broad layers of the population. Instead of this declamatory phrase, which wishes as though we will regret the ruin of the bourgeois and petty bourgeoisie, I just state the simple fact, which by the ruins of the urban and rural middle classes, the petty bourgeoisie and the small peasants widen and deepen the chasm between the haves and the have-nots. The last two phrases repeat the same thing. In appendix to section one, I give the draft amendment. Paragraph five, instead of the causes, it should read its causes, which is probably due to a slip of a pen. Paragraph six, mines, pits, quarries, see above paragraph one, private production, as see above. I would say the transformation of the present capitalist production on behalf of individuals or joint stock companies into socialist production on behalf of society as a whole, and according to a preconceived plan, transformation, et cetera, which creates and by which alone can be achieved the emancipation of the working class and with it the emancipation of all members of society without exception. Now, we notice that I don't remember that language being in the, the final version of the Erfurt program, so that's interesting. Paragraph 7, I would, I would say as in appendix to section 1. Paragraph 8, instead of class conscious, which in ours circles is an easily understood abbreviation, I would say the following facilitates universal understanding and translation into foreign languages with the workers conscious of their class position and something like it. But we can already see that the, the Marxist tendency to throw around class conscious and class consciousness was something Ingalls was wary of in 1891. Paragraph nine, closing sentence, places and thereby concentrates in the same hands the power of economic exploitation and political oppression. Paragraph 10, after class rule, the words and the classes themselves should be inserted. The abolition of classes is our basic demand, without which the abolition of class rule is economically inconceivable. Instead of for equal rights for all, I suggest for equal rights and equal duties for all, etc. Equal duties are for us particularly important addition to the bourgeois democratic equal rights and do away with their specifically bourgeois meaning. And the closing sentence, and that is added in the, in the final version, so we can see in, uh, Ingalls was listened to here. And the closing sentence, in their struggle are capable, would be better deleted. It's imprecise wording. Which are capable of improving the position of the people in general? Who is that? can be taken to embrace everything, protected tariffs and free trade, guilds and freedom of enterprise, loans and landed security, exchange banks, compulsory vaccination, and prohibition of vaccination, alcoholism and prohibition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
What should be said here, as has already been said earlier, and is unnecessary to mention specifically that the demand for the whole includes every separate part, for this, to my mind, weakens the impact. If, however, the sentence is intended to link to the past on to the individual demand, something resembling the following could be said. The social democracy fights for all demands which help approach its, this goal. Measures and arrangements should be deleted as repetitious, or else, which would be even better to say, to say directly what it is all about, i.e. that it is necessary to catch up with the bourgeoisie has missed. I have included a closing sentence in effect at appendix one. I will consider this important in my connection with the notes to the next section and the motivate proposals put forward by me therein. Political demands. Okay, this is where we get into more substantive critique. We notice that uh, Ingalls is kind of being, I don't know, um, but, uh, uh, repetitive here. I do think some of his rewordings are actually important for clarity. And some of them were taken. We can see and some of them weren't. Um, but let's go to the political demand section. The political demands of this draft have one great fault. It lacks precisely what should have been said. Of all to... If all the 10 demands are granted, we should indeed have a more diverse means of achieving our political aims, but the aim itself would be in no wise have been achieved. As regards to the rights being granted to the people and their representatives, the imperial constitution is, strictly speaking, a copy of the Prussian constitution of 1850, a constitution whose articles are extremely reactionary and give the government all the real power, while the chambers are not even allowed to reject taxes. A constitution which proved during the period of conflict that the government could do anything it liked with it. The rights of the Reichstag are the same as that of the Prussian chamber. And this is why Leibniz called for the Reichstag fig leaf of absolutism. Called this Reichstag a fig leaf of absolutism. It is an obvious absurdity, quote, to wish, uh, to wish, quote, to transform all the instruments of labor into common property on the basis of this constitution and the system of small states sanctioned by it on the basis of union between the between Prussia and the Rus Greece slice Lobenstein, in which one has as many square miles as the other has square inches. To touch on that is dangerous, however. So we have to be careful about what we say here because we're we're dipping into things that can get us suppressed. Nonetheless, somehow or the other, this thing has to be attacked. How necessary this is this is is shown precisely by the present time of a present time by opportunism, which is gaining ground by a large section of the social democratic press. Fearing or neural the anti-socialist laws are recalling all manner of overhasty pronounces made during the reign of that law. Now they want the party to present legal order in Germany adequate for putting through all the petty demands with peaceful means. These are attempts to convince oneself and the party that, quote, present day society is developing towards socialism, unquote, without asking oneself whether it does not thereby just as necessarily outgrow the old social order and whether it will not have to burst this shell by force as a crab breaks, breaks its shell, and also whether in Germany, in addition, it will not have to smash the feathers of the still semi-absolutist and more indescribably confused political order. One can conceive the old society may develop peacefully into the new one in countries where representatives of the people concentrate all the power in their hands, where if one has the support of the majority of the people, what can do as one sees fit in a constitutional way in democratic republics such as France and the USA and monarchies such as Britain, where the imminent abdication of the dynasty in return for financial compensation is discussed in the press daily and where this dynasty is powerless against the people. But in Germany, where the government is almost omnipotent and the Reichstag and all other representative bodies have no real power to advocate such a thing in Germany, when, moreover, there is no need to do so, means removing removing the fig leaves from absolutism, becoming a screen for its nakedness. And that's an interesting critique. Let's think of what he's saying here, that like we have to be honest that we need to get rid of whole elements of the Constitution and the state to set up a social society and to not, and to not do so is actually to preserve contemporary society through its constitutional order. In the long run, such a policy can only lead to one party, one's own parties astray. They push general abstract political questions into the foreground, thereby concealing the immediate concrete questions, which at the moment 
of the first great events, the first political crisis automatically pose themselves. What can result from this except the decisive movement moment the party suddenly proves helpless and the uncertainty and discord on the most decisive issues reign in and become these issues have never been discussed? Uh, uh, decisive issues reign in because these issues have never been discussed? Question mark. Must there be a repetition of what has happened with protective tariffs, where which were declared to be a matter of concern only to the bourgeoisie, not affecting the interests of the workers in the least? That is, a matter in which everyone could vote as he wished? Are there not many people now, now going to the opposite extreme? And are they not, in contrast to the bourgeoisie, who have been addicted to protective tariffs, rehashing the economic distortions of Cobden and Bright and preaching them as, as the purest socialism? the purest Manchesterisms, this forgetting of the great, the principal considerations for the momentary interest of the day, the struggling and striving for success of the moment, regardless of later consequences, the sacrifice of the future moment for its present may be honestly meant, but it is and remains opportunism, and honest opportunism is perhaps the most dangerous of all. Now, this is Varn talking about things. Uh, does honest opportunism sound interesting? Like it's been a common problem for you guys, and uh, are you mad at me for pointing out at you? You know, a lot of people seem to be. Let us continue. Which articulate subjects, but very significant points? First, if if one thing is certain, it is that our party and the working class can only come to power under the form of democratic republic. This is even the specific form of, for the dictatorship of the proletariat, as the great French Revolution has already shown. It would be inconceivable for our best people to become ministers under an emperor, as Miguel. It would seem, from the legal point of view, it is advisable to include the demand for a republic directly in the program, although this would... Th although this was possible even under Louis Philippe in France and is now in Italy, but the fact is that in Germany it is not permitted to advance even a Republican Party program openly proves how totally mistaken is the belief that a republic, and not only a republic, but also a communist society, can be established in a cozy, peaceful way. Damn. However, the question of the republic could possibly be passed by. What, however, in my opinion, should and could be included is the demand for the concentration of all political power in the hands of the people's representatives. That would suffice for the, for the time being if it is impossible to go any further. So we see here him saying we should put, you know, basically we should put uh, all the key power in the hands of the, of the people's representatives and the legislature. It makes our obsession uh, in contemporary politics with the executive very interesting, doesn't it? Second, the Constitution of Germany... On one hand, the system of small states must be abolished just to try to revolutionize society while there are the Bavarian Württemberg reservation rights and the map of the present day Thuringia. I don't know how to say that. For example, it's a sorry site. On the other hand, Prussia must cease to exist and must be broken up into self-governing provinces for specific Prussianism to stop weighing on Germany. The system of small states and Prussianism are two sides of the antithesis now gripping Germany in a vice, which on one side must always serve as an excuse and a justification for the existence of the other. Uh, this might actually have some, while it doesn't affect a lot of modern socialists, this actually might have some implication for the United States, where there is both a, an attempt to centralize power, which might be misguided, particularly if you do it before the war socialists are in real control and there's also an attempt to more federate power which might play into the hands of very reactionary state actors as we've seen under the biden administration although conservative federalism was largely abandoned during the trump and so we're stuck in this vice of either empowering the federal government before anyone who we really want to controls it or helping small states assume reactionary power for themselves we should have to think of coordination in a different way and even Ingalls realizes that what should what should take its place in my view the proletariat can only use a form of the one and indivisible republic in the gigantic territory of the united states the federal republic is still on the whole a necessity 
although in the eastern states it's already becoming a hindrance. It would be a step forward in Britain, where the two islands are peopled by four nations, and in spite of a single parliament, three different systems of legislation already exist side by side. So the, the idea that Marxists always want centralization is actually complicated here. Ingalls is saying there are times where a confederation might be necessary. In Little Switzerland, it has long been a hindrance, tolerable only because Switzerland's contempt to be a purely passive member of the European state system. For Germany, federalization on the switch model would be an enormous step backwards. Two points distinguish a union state completely from a unified state. First, that each member state, each canton, has its own civil and criminal legislature and judicial system. And second, that alongside a popular chamber, there's also a federal chamber in which each canton, whether large or small, votes as such. This first we have locally overcome and should not be so chattis as to reintroduce it. The second we have in the Bundesrat and could very well do without it, as we could the Senate. Since our federal state generally constitutes a transition to, to a unified state, the revolution of 1866 and 1870 must not be reversed from above, but supplemented and improved by a movement from below. So you can't just top-down implement this stuff, guys. So then a unified republic. But not in the sense of the present French Republic, which was nothing but an empire established in 1799 without an emperor. Asterisk. For those people who think that Marxism is really good, really positive on liberal imperialism, I do think they should read this. An asterisk. From 1792 to 1799, each French department, each commune enjoyed complete self-government on the American model. And this is what we too must have. How self-government is to be organized and how it can be managed without a bureaucracy has been shown to us by America and the First French Republic, and is being shown to us today by Australia, Canada, and the other English colonies. And a provincial and communal self-government of this type is far freer than, for instance, Swiss federalism, under which it is true the, the canton is very independent in relation to the federation, but also in the, independent in relation to the district and the commune. The cantonal governments appoint the district governors and prefects, which are unknown in English-speaking countries and which we want to abolish here as resolutely in the future as the Persian land right and the reconquer... I can't... My... Reg Kron... Reg Kron... I think that's Switzerland Dutch, which is why I can't say it. All right. Probably a few of these points should be included in the program. I mention them also to describe the system in Germany where such matters cannot be discussed openly and to emphasize the self-deception of those who wish to transform such a system in a legal way into a communist society. Further, to remind the party executive that there are other important political questions besides direct legislation by the people and gratuitous administration of justice without which we can also ultimately get by. And the generally unstable conditions, these questions may become urgent at a time. And what will happen then if we have not discussed by us beforehand and there's no agreement has been reached on them? So he's saying we need to talk about this and make sure we understand this as a collective organ before we do anything. So we need to start talking about it now and hint at it in our program so that we can talk about it more directly in person. However, what can be included in the program and can, at least indirectly, serve as a hint of what may not be said directly in the following demand. Complete self-government in the provinces, districts, and communes through officials elected by universal suffrage. The abolition of all local and provisional authorities appointed by the state. We saw this language in the program. Whether or not it is possible to formulate other programmatic demands in connection with the points discussed above, I am less able to judge here than you over there. He's anyone there in Germany. But it would be desirable to debate these questions within the party before it is too late. One, I fail to, to see the difference between election rights and voting rights, between elections and voting, respectively. If such a distinction should be made, it should be in any case expressed more clearly and explained in a commentary appended to the draft. Two, the right of people to propose and reject what? All laws or decisions of the people's representatives? This should be added. So we have here the right of the people, I guess, by... Um, by, uh, I don't know, plebiscite or um, uh, referendum to reject uh, unproposed laws, something like California. Ingalls is apparently behind that. 
Complete separation of church from the state. All religious communities without exception are to be treated by the state as private associations. We saw this language in the final version. They are to be deprived of any support from public forums, which we have failed to do in America. We used to kind of do it, but we have been eroding that for uh, 75 years. And of all influence on public education, which we kind of declined to do in America, didn't do in America before the uh, Civil War amendments anyway, and uh, barely do after. They cannot be prohibited from forming their own schools out of their own funds and teaching their own nonsense in them. So this is interesting. <laughs> Private religious schools are something English finds annoying, but would actually allow. In that case, the point on secular character of schools no longer rises since it is related to the preceding paragraph. Eight and nine. Here I want to draw attention to the following. These points demand that the following should be taken over by the state, the bar, the medical services, pharmacies, dentistry, midwifery, nursing, et cetera, et cetera. And the land of the man has advanced that the worker's insurance become a state concerned. Can we can all this be entrusted to Mr. Von Capri? And is it compatible with the rejection of all state socialism as stated above? Socialism and nationalization are not the same. And here I should add, progressive tax to cover all expenditures of the state, district, and community insofar as taxes are required for it. Abolition of all indirect state and local taxes and duties. The rest is a redundant commentary or motivation that tends to weaken the effect. The economic demands. To item two, nowhere more so than Germany does the right of association require guarantees also from the state. And the closing phrase for regulation, etc., should be added as an item four and be cor in, in corresponding form. And then this connection, it should be noted that we have been taken a good and proper by labor chambers made up of half of workers and half of entrepreneurs. For years to, to come, the entrepreneurs would always have a majority for a single black sheep among the workers will be needed to achieve this. If it is not agreed upon that in the cases of conflict, both halves express separate opinions, it would be much better to have a chamber of entrepreneurs and, in addition, an independent chamber of workers. Keep your workers and entrepreneurs separate. In conclusion, I should request that the draft be compared with, with the French program with some things I've seen more better, seen better precisely for Section 3 being... Being pressed for, for time, I unfortunately cannot search for the Spanish program, which is also very good in many respects. Appendix to Section 1. Pitts quarries delete. Railways and other means of communication. In the hands of their appropriators, the social means of labor have become means of, of, exp of exploitation. The economic subjugation of the worker by the appropriator of means of labor, that is to say, of the means of livelihood, condition thereby, is the basis of slavery in all forms, social misery, mental degradation, and dependence. Under this exploitation, the wealth created by the exploited is concentrated in the hands of the exploiters, the capitalists and big landowners with growing speed. The distribution of the product of labor between the exploiters and exploited becomes even more even, and the numbers and insecurity of the proletariat grow up for the greater, etc. Private production delete, deteriorate by, by ruins of urban and rural middle classes, petty blows between small peasants or widen or deepen the chasm between the haves and the have-nots, make general insecurity for the normal state of society, improve the class of appropriators of the social means of labor have lost their vocation and ability for political leadership. Its causes. Six, transformation of capital production on behalf of the individual. Our joint stock companies and the socialist production on behalf of the whole society as a whole. And according to a preconceived plan, a transformation for which capital society itself creates material and spiritual conditions and by which alone can be achieved the emancipation of the working class with its emancipation of all members of society without exception. The emancipation of working class can be the work only of the working class itself. It is self-evident the working class cannot leave its emancipation either to the capitalists or the big landowners, its opponents and exploiters, or to the Betty bourgeoisie and the small peasants who, being stifled by competition on the part of big exploiters, have no choice but to join in their ranks are those of the workers. So the interim classes have to pick a side. Would workers conscious of their class position places thereby concentrates in the hands of small power of economic exploiters and political expression and oppression of the workers class rule on the classes themselves for equal and equal rights and duties for of all without uh, etc origin delete end in struggle for mankind is obstructed by germany's backward political state first and foremost it has to conquer uh, room for a movement to abolish massive survivals of feudalism and absolutism. In short, to do the work in which the German bourgeois parties were and still are too cowardly to carry out, hence it has, at least in present, to include all such demands in this program, which in other cultural countries have already been implemented by the bourgeoisie.
that was not in there, I don't think. Now we can see that a lot is made out of small parts of this critique. The Maoists make a lot of imperialism, which is not even mentioned directly, just the tendency of capital to monopolize and the problems of the state. Uh, left communists have noted that, and I have noted in the past, that Ingalls actually makes pains to point out that socialization and nationalization are not the same thing, and we can't trust a bourgeois or even semi-feudal nation-state to do our bidding just because it might help us in the short run, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we can also see that that unlike the Goethe program, um, the exceptions here, while some of them are important politically in the political demands, and there are major concerns that he has about being overly optimistic about German constitutionalism, not dealing with the semi-feudal elements of the state, um, et cetera, there are also concerns about how this leads to opportunism and opportunism, even of the honest kind, becomes a problem eventually. But this is a very small critique compared to Goethe. I don't think we can actually adopt what the Irish and British Communist Organization called for, for example, uh, there as as being as significant. And while I do think the difference between socialization and nationalization is important, Ingalls actually doesn't go very deeply into it here. It's just hinted at. All right. Now it is important to remember that when this was, this was mailed out, this is when Ingalls also published the critique of the Bertha program, uh, probably to kind of get people to, a, to sign on to the effort program by pointing out that Marx and Engels didn't really love the Goethe program, which does make some defenses of it, of the Goethe program by later socialists a little interesting. And on that note, we're going to conclude this series on the effort program and go back to, to the reception history of the critique of the Goethe program. Mm -hmm.